So go to the test suite. We're going to go to the test remove. After we've removed everything from the tree, we're going to remove an element that we know is not in the tree. And of course, after we've removed every, everything from the tree, anything we choose should not be in the tree. So minus 999 will work as well as anything. So we're going to go ahead and save that and run the coverage tool again. So this time something interesting happens. What happened is the remove method for the splay tree on removal of minus 999, so on the line that we just added, causes an exception to be thrown in the splay function. And so let's go back and look at the splay tree code. So when we remove an element from the tree that wasn't there, it's supposed to raise the exception key not found in tree. On the other hand, what it's actually doing is failing quite a bit below here in the middle of the splay function when the code does a comparison against an element of type none. And so that's probably not what the developer intended. By adding just a little bit to our test suite, we seem to have found a bug not anticipated by the uh, developer of the splay tree. And I think this example is illustrative for a couple of reasons. First of all, the coverage tool, the very first time we ran it, told us something that we didn't know. And this is my experience in general that this is what happens when you use a coverage tool. It's basically very similar to the first time you run a profiling tool on a piece of code, where it turns out that usually the functions that are using up CPU time are not the ones that you necessarily thought were using up CPU time. Well, coverage tools are very similar. It often turns out that the stuff that you thought was going to run might not be running, or at least some of it. It often turns out that some of the stuff that you thought was going to run doesn't get run. So it told us something interesting, and that's nice. Now, on the other hand, if the coverage tool hadn't told us anything interesting, that is to say, if it told us that everything that we hoped was executing when we ran the unit test was executing, well, then that's good too. We get to sleep a little easier. The second thing to notice is a much more subtle point. And this point is that we added a test case to execute this line of code. But it turned out that the bug wasn't right here. The bug was somewhere completely different, buried in the splay routine. And if we go back and look at the coverage information, it's going to turn out that the splay routine is entirely covered. That is to say, Every line of the splay routine was executed during the execution of the unit test for the splay tree. This serves to make a couple of points. First of all, just because some code was covered, especially at the statement level, this doesn't mean anything about whether it contains bugs or not. It just means that it ran at least once. The other thing is, is that, and the second thing is, we have to ask the question, what do we really want to read into the fact that we failed to cover something? The thing to not read into it is that a failed piece of coverage is a mandate to write a test that covers this test case. That's what we did. That's not a good general lesson. Rather, the way we should think about this is, is that the coverage tool is giving us a bit, of, a bit of evidence, is giving us an example suggesting that our test suite is poorly thought out. That is to say that our test suite is failing to exercise functionality that's present in our code. And what that means is we haven't thought about this problem very well, and we need to rethink the test suite. So to summarize that, when coverage fails, it's better to try to think about why we went wrong rather than just blindly writing a test case to exercise the code which wasn't covered.